based on a paper I published in late 2023. I think it was December, but I can't guarantee uh, the date. Um, and it was of the same title. So some of the content of this presentation is just a direct excerpt from that paper. And it draws on my experiences using Wikipedia as a pedagogical tool between 2019 and 2022 over five separate terms um, during my tenure at McMaster University. So as Julia mentioned, I was at Brock in 2013-2014 and then um, I moved on to McMaster for a permanent position. And I came back to Brock in May 2023 to take on the role of a department head in the university library's new research life cycle department. So before coming back to Brock, um, I was at McMaster for nine years uh, at McMaster's Health Sciences Library specifically as an academic librarian there. And I offered teaching and learning as well uh, expertise as well as systematic searching expertise to researchers and students. Um, and I was also um, a part-time instructor teaching an inquiry-based course in the Bachelor of Health Sciences program. And this course was initially called the Politics of Health Information, but later became known simply as Health Information. Uh, so the content of this presentation is going to focus on my story using Wikipedia to teach information literacy and knowledge translation skills to undergraduate health sciences students. So there's going to be a pretty... Uh, strong lean towards like a health science focus, but really using Wikipedia in uh, education um, has can be for anything, any subject. Okay, so the full title of this presentation um, was on the website, Leveraging Wikipedia in Undergraduate Education, uh, Undergraduate Health Sciences Education, a Key Tool for Information Literacy and Knowledge Translation. That's a bit of a mouthful and I didn't like it on the title slide. So, um, but what I've done here is provided you with um, the full citation to the article as well. And I'm not sure how the slides will be made um, available, but I plan on depositing them in our institutional repository so I can always provide um, access to these slides um, when this is over. So before we dive in, I'm not sure what expertise we have with us today. I know there's a lot of CPI folks, so some of this might be a um, review for you, um, but I thought I'd give a super brief overview of what is information literacy and what is knowledge translation within the context of my experience teaching um, these concepts and skills. So information literacy. There's this common misconception amongst non-librarians and even amongst some librarians that information literacy is limited to just knowing how to search a database or knowing how to use Google um, efficiently. And this perception of information literacy is actually limited. Um, An information literate individual knows how to use library databases and can efficiently search Google, sure. That's fine, but they also have a broader theoretical understanding of information creation and dissemination practices as well. So officially, librarians often refer to the um, ACRL, that's the Association of College and Research Libraries. Um, they have a framework for information literacy for higher education. And this is used um, to kind of guide how librarians approach teaching information literacy in various contexts. And it's really made up of um, six interconnected concepts. And so, you know, this framework identifies information literacy as like six um, threads or frames um, that can be woven together. So the first authority is constructed and contextual. This means that what we designate as an authoritative information resource isn't necessarily black and white. Um, authority is a social construct, and so we really need to consider um, how authority is assigned and designated um, to different resources, and the context um, of our information need can sometime determine um, what we des designate as an authoritative resource. Information creation um, as a process means creating information is dynamic. And again, it's contextual and can evolve. And again, these are really high level, like we're not gonna get into the weeds here. We could do a whole course <laughs> on information literacy. Um, third, information has value. Information has academic value, yes, um, but it's also a commodity. Um, it has economic value. 
And also legal and socioeconomic interests do influence information production and creation. And we see these in the biases um, that we know about that exist in uh, published literature, such as a preference not to publish pre uh, negative results. Um, fourth, research as inquiry. Research is iterative, right? It's not always a straightforward process. We often take what we learn, go back um, and, and start again. Five, scholarship as a conversation. Communities of scholars and researchers um, share their perspectives, new knowledge and insights in a shared community. Um, and in this community and in this conversation, there's space for varied perspectives. Um, and then six, searching as strategic exploration. This is what I feel like a lot of folks tend to limit information literacy to. Um, searching for information is non-linear. We don't start at point A and like do this smooth road to point B. It's often, a, you know, we get a little bit ahead and then we have to go back and reassess and we move forward a little bit more. Um, so it requires some mental flexibility and agility. And so ideally, when students graduate from an undergraduate education, um, they graduate as adaptive, lifelong learners who understand the politics of knowledge production and dissemination and understand the publication landscape and, most importantly, um, understand their position, perhaps of privilege, um, as students who have access to high quality evidence through their library. And if they're not aware of that um, privilege, they will be once they graduate because they the library will cut them off. Um, so having the skills to search the library databases and tools for that information um, is just as important as understanding the value of that information, the contextuality of what we call authority, and thinking critically about the biases entrenched in traditional systems of knowledge production um, and dissemination, so research and publication. Um, also, um, the information literacy is and lifelong learning um, in 2005, so almost 20 years ago now, were identified by the Alexandria Proclamation um, as beacons of the information age. And this, um, there's like a, a document, document as a report from a meeting um, that made this statement. And that was, was sponsored by UNESCO, the National Forum on Information Literacy and IFLA, the International Feder Federation of Library Associations. So you can see, um, it's not just a library thing, even though libraries and library librarians are tend to be the folks who are driving information literacy education um, at universities. Um, you know, having the the UN involved there and a national forum on information literacy, there's space for uh, this type of work um, across campus. So, knowledge uh, translation. Uh, I'm a little bit. Um, not an expert, I guess I should say, on knowledge translation, but I have some sense of what it is. So um, it's more recently known as knowledge mobilization, which is probably a term you've heard on campus. Um, it's a really rapidly growing field in academic. It's kind of just recently started to gain momentum. Um, you've seen our research impact hub down in the Rankin Family Pavilion. There's um, a focus within Office of Research Services on knowledge mobilization. Uh, Jane Morris in, Morris in the Office of Research Services offers an excellent workshop on knowledge mobilization. Um, but really, knowledge mobilization, knowledge translation um, isn't new. It's been around for quite some time. And uh, in 2009, an article focusing on uh, that focused on defining the term knowledge translation was published in the Canadian Medical Association Journal. And so since I'm not as much of an expert on knowledge translation as I am on information literacy, um, I just figured it would be best to read, <laughs> read the definition. So, you know, formally knowledge translation is defined by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research as a dynamic and iterative process that includes the synthesis, dissemination, exchange, and ethically sound application of knowledge to improve health, provide more effective health services and products, and strengthen the healthcare system. And this definition has been adapted by others, such as the United States National Center for Dissemination of Disability Research and the World Health Organization. And really, the main driver of knowledge translation is to move beyond the simple dissemination of knowledge um, through 
research publications and conference presentations into ensuring that the knowledge that you've created is actually getting used. And so knowledge creation, knowledge distillation, um, and knowledge dissemination um, really aren't enough on, on their own to ensure the use of knowledge in decision making. So by knowledge creation, I mean like primary research. For knowledge distillation, I mean systematic reviews, so these like evidence syntheses, secondary studies, um, and then knowledge distillation, like I mentioned, or sorry, knowledge dissemination, like I mentioned, uh, presentations, papers, um, those are not enough on their own to ensure that the use of this, uh, that this knowledge is being used um, by the general public or by practitioners. And so um, also want to clarify that knowledge translation isn't related to commercialization or bringing products to market or technology transfer. So it's really focused on application and use of knowledge in decision-making. Um, so that's like my brief uh, lunchtime 101 uh, intro to information literacy and knowledge translation. And so I'll talk a little bit about why Wikipedia, why, why I decided to use Wikipedia in an undergraduate classroom. Academic institutions and libraries were not strangers to Wikipedia. Uh, historically, the resource has been stigmatized in academia, but some educators have actually embraced it for its broad reach um, and its utility as an educational tool. So the peer-reviewed literature offers a breadth of rationales, um, foci, and exemplars for the inclusion of Wikipedia editing in courses, in an assignment, or in library instruction sessions. And these have included, but aren't necessarily limited to, um, decolonizing information uh, and educational curricula, understanding core concepts in a variety of disciplines, ranging from STEM to the humanities, teaching evidence-based practice in health fields, and teaching information literacy. Um, however, the reason I wrote this paper um, was because there was actually very little coverage of Wikipedia-based assignments in undergraduate health education um, outside of, you know, but there was lots of, um, well, not lots, but there's like a nice body of knowledge on uh, professional health education. So like undergraduate medicine programs, nursing programs, uh, pharmacy, things like that. But for undergraduate health sciences students, uh, this was, from what I know, the first uh, published um, article that reports on, on such a program. So in the context of academic librarianship, the inclusion of Wikipedia-based work is easily mapped onto the ACRL's framework that I mentioned earlier, namely the construction and contextuality of authority, the process of information creation, and the value of information. Further through the lens of critical information literacy, um, the which basically the difference between information literacy straight and in critical information literacy is that we consider the core concepts of information literacy through a critical lens when we think about systems of power and biases as well. And so the for uh, through that lens of critical information literacy, the inclusion of Wikipedia based work in higher education has also been argued to improve knowledge equity alongside the development of students' um, understanding of systemic and institutional biases. So why Wikipedia's health content? Well, I already mentioned that I was a health sciences librarian. Um, I've also done um, quite a bit of uh, investigation into Wikipedia as a um, health information resource for consumers, so for the general public. Um, but beyond that, Wikipedia is one of the most frequently accessed websites in the world. Um, and English Wikipedia's health and medical pages are actually ac accessed more frequently than any other health and medical website in the US and Canada. So Wikipedia is being looked at uh, with greater frequency than stuff than websites that librarians and um, health professionals might recommend first, such as um, uh, not WebMD, <laughs> um, Medline. I, oh, I'm so rusty on my health sciences librarianship, Medline Plus. Um, and uh, Mayo Clinic or Mayo Clinic. So uh, research suggests also that uh, Wikipedia is a familiar resource and I'm total like full disclosure, this is my research that I did. So, uh, and it's one of two studies that looked at why people are using Wikipedia. So 
the research is limited. Um, but what I have found is that people who are using Wikipedia are going there because it's comfortable and familiar. They've used it before in other contexts, so why not use it for health information? Um, it's easy to read, so um, Wikipedia contribute contributors focus on using plain language to distill uh, complex medical terminology. And I've even interviewed physicians who use it um, to explain complex medical conditions to their family because they're so hung up in their medical knowledge that they um, have a difficult time just using describing these concepts with plain language. So they rely on Wikipedia to help them with that. Um, and also, like you, you've probably used Wikipedia yourself, and if you don't admit it, that's fine, but I know that you probably have. Um, and also it does what the other piece that I found um, when I was interviewing folks was um, a theme that it facilitates open dialogue. So between patient and physician. Um, so these like, Wikipedia summaries provide patients with some vocabulary to ask questions um, and, effect and effectively engage in dialogue about their health. So why teach with it, right? So students have access to a broad range of academic resources that are not typically um, accessible without paid subscription. Uh, we're moving very, very, very slowly towards a model of open availability, but that's still not the reality. And so some of the highest quality health information is locked behind paywalls and university students do tend to have access to those resources if the library has paid for them. Upper year students have learned some degree of knowledge translation skills already and ideally, but I know not realistically, I, information literacy skills too. Um, and they're not so entrenched in their discipline um, that it's become a significant challenge to use plain language. They're still interacting with folks who might be outside of their area of study, for example. Um, so it's not as great a leap um, to jump into this plain language uh, skill, this knowledge translation skill. It's also an interesting and valuable opportunity to teach um, um, skills and reflective learning. So to teach editing skills, to teach information literacy skills, um, and then also to teach uh, reflective practice. Um, so um, students can reflect on their privilege and the perceived impact of their work. Um, and students are actually motivated to do well because their work um, is, quote, out there um, for review and for scrutiny. So what does it look like? Uh, so the course that I would offer uses an inquiry-based learning model, um, which positions me, the instructor, as an expert guide as the students navigate their own learning journeys. And there is some structure to this course, perhaps more than preferred for an inquiry-based model, but the structure is important in this particular context to build a foundation for um, the editing project. And so to set the stage uh, for Wikipedia authorship, the first three weeks of the course are dedicated to reflecting on information production and uh, this concept of what makes an information resource authoritative. Um, and this is because by third year of Bachelor of Health Sciences program, these students have um, fully absorbed the paradigm of the evidence hierarchy. Um, and if you're not familiar with what that is, there's basically this like triangle model where like we have primary studies near the bottom, like single studies, and then it gradually move up higher and higher into the triangle until we get to these high level um, preferred gold standard sources. And all the way at the top would be clinical practice guidelines in the, con in the context of health. Um, and so they fully kind of um, absorbed that mentality. And they've also adopted a thought process that there's really only five journals that matter in health. Um, um, and these are like the big five, New England Journal of Medicine, Nature, uh, British Medical Journal, and so on. And so my goal is kind of start this course by turning that on its head and really challenging the students to think differently about resources that they assume are authoritative or even to think differently about the evidence-based model and what evidence, what um, what we consider high quality evidence. And we do this in a couple ways. Like one thing is I have them read um, an article about how the newest 
um, food guide was um, created, how decisions were made on that, and they become aware of um, some of the socio and political um, influences on the creation of that guide. Um, and often in their reflections, they're shocked and dismayed that socio-political um, influence could, could, could determine the outcome of a resource, a nutritional resource that they just assumed because it was government produced was evidence, strictly evidence-based. Um, and the other article I have them read is a um, article about how journal impact factor scores can be tweaked by journals through self-citations, uh, things like that. And again, it kind of positions them to think twice about this value that they've just automatically assign um, to a journal impact factor score. Um, so at the same time that I have students thinking outside that like evidence-based medicine box, um, they are simultaneously assigned training modules through Wiki Education, which is a program that provides resources to facilitate or support Wikipedia editing assignments or courses. So students uh, simultaneously learn how to edit Wikipedia's health and medical information, including getting access um, to the various guidelines and procedures while gaining an alternative perspective on the value of health information. And given the rigorous uh, contribution policies and guidelines for authoring health and medical content on Wikipedia, the training is the most structured component of the course, and that's why. And Wiki Education is super helpful in helping you uh, develop your course. They have an online space for your course where you can assign milestones that they suggest. Um, and so it's really customizable based on, on what you're offering. And I find um, I did want to mention, too, that th because my experience is limited to health and medical articles, there are um, pretty rigorous contribution policies and guidelines for all of Wikipedia, but they're like next level for health and medical information because of the potential um, for harm if 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 there's um, any editing guidelines are violated, like um, jumping to like, you know, summarizing the results of two primary studies and then drawing comparisons that's considered original research in Wikipedia. So um, we those um, those types of things are heavily monitored um, in in Wikipedia by the community. So um, after we got through those first through few weeks, um, we also asked the students to um, form small groups and select a health related topic relevant uh, and a relevant Wikipedia article. And sometimes I ask them to select a couple relevant articles and then choose one that either requires um, that requires improvement in some capacity. And so this could either be an extensive review and overhaul um, and by adding um, up-to-date citations and maybe rewriting significant portions. Um, to, um, but it could also include an article that's already, you know, moderately developed. And they also have the choice to choose a stub or start class article. So a stub article is a Wikipedia article where maybe there's someone basically just decided that we need we need a Wikipedia article on X topic. And so they've created the article and there's maybe like one sentence or two sentences. And so it really requires substantial attention. A start class article is something that's slightly more developed than a subclass article, but still um, isn't considered robust enough to be um, reliable. So each group um, submits um, a project plan that outlines their topic and article of choice. They, I ask them to include a rationale for their choice and to include an analysis of the article in its current state, followed by a list of uh, SMART goals for their group contributions over the course of the semester. And following the Wiki Education Program with the Wiki Education Dashboard um, to identify milestones such as like completion of the training modules, um, creating an account. Um, we do all of that uh, to monitor student progress. And the nice thing about the Wiki Education platform too is once the students have been assigned their articles, um, I can go and look at the article through that dashboard and I can see all the changes that have been made and they're highlighted in different colors depending on the user that made those changes, the user in my class. Um, Three to four weeks into their editing journey, each group is also asked to submit a progress report. And this update is um, probably for me what I consider to be the most valuable part of the course uh, or using this model. 
Um, and because it's an opportunity for students to reassess their initial project plan, um, the feasibility of their goals, and to adjust their path moving forward if they think that's um, more appropriate. And so this is crucial because students are not frequently provided an opportunity to shift gears once they've started a project. And that doesn't necessarily reflect the reality of everyday life. So the progress report allows students to reflect on their progress so far and with the added perspective of ha having already begun to make live edits to an article, they can rethink their initial often ambitious goals. Most of the time they start off with extremely ambitious goals. And once they realize just how much um, invisible labor goes into adding a sentence on Wikipedia, they tend to need that progress report as an invitation to take a step back. Um, it also, the progress report also, is, uh, also incentivizes students to begin editing a live Wikipedia article as soon as possible. Um, in the five times I've offered this course, students were pretty consistent across the board in their hesitation to begin editing live articles. However, once they actually started, um, they really started to gain confidence and that confidence gained momentum after their first contributions. Um, but getting that initial push, it is almost always a fairly significant struggle. Editing typically happens during the scheduled course meeting time. So this isn't something that you know I'm assigning and then they're just doing on their own time. Um, and this is because if we can edit during scheduled course meeting times in that second half of the term, it fosters a supportive environment for editing where student editors can ask questions, seek advice, request support when corresponding with other editors or responding to community feedback. Once their edits are out there, they're out there for review. Um, and so there's often this often triggers conversations with other editors who aren't associated with the course, who have suggestions, who have questions, who might have concerns about their about the resources that they're citing. And so having the editing occur in uh, in the class time makes it easy for me to insert myself into community discussions involving student editors and to and to ensure that the students are supported. At the end of the term, each group of students presents a project report to share um, their contributions to Wikipedia and the impact of those contributions. Students are invited to use um, quantitative measures of the impact of their impact, such as page views since they began editing, but they're also encouraged to reflect on the meaningfulness of their contributions. What does it mean to have contributed to a widely read information resource? And this is um, this report is also presented in class for the benefit of all students. So they write a report and then they present to the whole class on it. So that's what it looks like. And the outcomes of this being offered um, five times since 2019, um, we've had 64 student editors. So you'll note that it's quite small class sizes. And I think that's for the best. That's part of the inquiry model. They usually cap enrollment at 20. I've had 20 students and it's been okay, but I prefer class sizes of no more than 15, like 10 to 15 tends to be a good um, environment for me in terms of what my brain can handle all the moving parts. Um, so we've had a 64 student editors We've made contributions to 25 health related articles in Wikipedia, um, and that includes articles that have just had little tiny tweaks. For the most part, we've had, um, you know, significant contributions to fewer. And the students have added more than 120,000 words to these articles, and they've added citations to over 2,000 high quality secondary sources. Um, and for me, that's probably the most impressive number because the key the key goal for Wikipedia is that every sentence is verified with a high quality, reliable citation. Um, and so the fact that these students are making these kinds of contributions with their references um, is, for me, the most important piece of this work. All these contributions are actually tracked in the Wiki Education in a dashboard. So I've created a link to our dashboard there. It's publicly available um, to see what kind of work. And what we typically try to do is um, it's publicly available, but um, the editors listed there, the student editors are listed by their username, um, which is not affiliated with their Brock user or their 
in this case, McMaster username, user ID. Um, it's a totally separate and independent account. So also outcomes at the end of this um, course, students were able to critically analyze traditionally authoritative sources of health information and critically engage with non-traditional sources or, um, and by traditional, non-traditional, I mean what we view as authoritative in the context of Western medicine. They were also able to contribute to the health information landscape as participatory producers of high quality health information for public consumption. They were able to understand that the health information landscape is complex and that students do have a role within it, right? The common per, um, perception at the beginning of each iteration of this course is that, oh, we're just undergraduate students. We don't have any authority. We don't have anything to contribute, but they actually do. And they realize the, um, they realize the full scope of what they have to offer through this assignment. They're also able to identify strengths and challenges of health information in its different formats. And this, by this, I mean whether or not a resource is available, open access, or if it's behind a pay wall, what that means for other community members in Wikipedia verifying their contributions. Also, students uh, weren't like formally interviewed or anything um, because I didn't study them, um, but what I did ask students to do is at the very end, as part of their final report, I had each student independently write a one to two page reflection of this of the semester and, and what they learned um, and specifically ask them to consider what their perception of Wikipedia was as a health information resource at the beginning of the term and how they feel about it now. Um, and at, so at the end of the term, they reflected on um, the meaningfulness of contributing to Wikipedia. So they felt that using a project to contribute, a research project essentially to contribute to Wikipedia had meaning compared to writing a term paper that would get graded and then would move into the abyss, right? Um, there were also conversations um, within the reflections and then also in class on our last day about students' strengthened ability to scrutinize the information they find online in Wikipedia and beyond Wikipedia. And interestingly, many students considered to demonstrate, sorry, I skipped ahead here, um, con continued to demonstrate um, a healthy skepticism about the quality of information on Wikipedia and online in general. Um, which is great. Yeah, I wasn't trying to turn them into like um, completely biased in one direction that Wikipedia is great and there are no issues. There's tons of issues. Um, but what they were able to do um, was kind of maintain that skepticism about the quality of information on Wikipedia and online in general, but impressively expressed a new confidence in their ability to identify when information on Wikipedia might be suitable for their needs or the needs of someone else and when different sources might be more appropriate. And because they had to back up everything they wrote on Wikipedia with a high quality citation, they developed that skill of looking for very specific materials um, in library databases as well. There was conversations as well about knowledge translation. So namely the translation, I've mentioned this a little bit, of complex health and medical language into plain, easy to understand, with, understand language. So um, some students uh, also went on to continue to make improvements to Wikipedia, both informally on their own time and also formally as part of a more intensive fourth year project, either as an independent project or as part of their, I had two students approach me about doing an independent project and two additional students approach me about doing um, significant contributions to Wikipedia content as part of their thesis honors project. And so I just wanna highlight before I wrap up a few uh, um, like proud moments, I suppose, like some, some, uh, a, some brief highlights here. So um, this work, this graph is actually the product of, of a student project. They gave me permission to share this slide. Um, so this work is from 2020. So from the fall, I had students in the fall of 2020 when we were all learning online. And this particular group of study, uh, group of students edited the Wikipedia article on attenuated vaccines. 
Um, when And when they were writing up their report on the impact of their work, they noticed a distinct spike across the attenuated vaccine article, vaccines, um, the attenuated vaccine article is the light blue line, um, but then there's the green line is for the vax article about vaccines in general. Inactive vaccines is red and then coronavirus vaccine um, is orange there. And you can see these distinct spikes in page views um, and the dates that they correspond with. So um, November 9th, November 16th, and uh, November 23rd. And what they noticed when they looked at that spike is they went to look at the news uh, from those dates and they noticed that those spikes in page views corresponded um, with the same dates that Pfizer, Moderna and AstraZeneca released their interim data analysis that indicated a high efficacy rate for each of those vaccines. And so when the students noticed this spike and identified a relationship, um, that was when it really struck them that the work they were doing to improve that the attenuated vaccine articles could potentially have a big impact. And I think exposing students to that before they hit medical school or grad school, um, this idea that their efforts matter and have impact is really important. And so I was really glad to see um, for, th for this particular group, there was like a visceral indication of, of the impact. And I, total sidebar, I recently also published an article, just an editorial about these page view spikes to demonstrate how much the public does really rely on Wikipedia for health information. And one of the key examples I used was um, Damar Hamlin of the Buffalo Bills when he collapsed on the field and suffered a cardiac arrest. There were enormous spikes in the cardiac arrest article on Wikipedia in the page views. And on top of that, two weeks later, when Lisa Marie uh, Presley passed away due to uh, where she was found having cardiac arrest. Um, two weeks later, it corresponded as well as again, an, another spike. So it's not just limited, you know, it's not just isolated to COVID-19 being something that um, was a relatively unknown thing. Um, cardiac arrest has been around forever. So um, it, but these spikes were still there. So there is public need. Also beyond the inquiry course, one of my students took on an independent project, just checking the time, took on an independent project editing Wikipedia content last January that he worked on for several months. And this, uh, the January, it was January, I said last January, but that's because this is old. Um, it was right before, it was the January before um, the mass graves of, at the indigenous reg residential schools were, were discovered. And so he finished this work around the time that that discovery was made. And his work on the nutritional experiments in residential schools was very timely as a result of that. Um, and so he found it really rewarding that he was able to produce a much improved article on Wikipedia about First Nations nutrition experiments when this was becoming kind of headline news. Um, and he's a, a health sciences student and is now and he's actually in medical school now. Um, and this editing, this article was a really great opportunity for him to put into practice um, and understand the contextuality of authority um, and to engage in non-European ways of knowing because many of the resources that he used um, as references were, would not meet the, uh, the criteria for medical articles. So that's um, it for me. Uh, I'm just going to end the slideshow and see if I can see you all.